What's up and welcome to another episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we're looking at the world's fastest 15 inch laptop. There is literally no other laptop that is faster, especially from a processor perspective. And here's why. We have a full desktop 9900K in this 15 inch chassis, which is basically unheard of. This thing is a little performance monster. There was a Asus laptop from last year that did have a Ryzen 7 1700 that was an eight core processor, but the clock speeds on that were far, far lower compared to this machine. And this one is about the same size probably as that one, but they managed to fit in the top of the line Nvidia 1080 graphics card. This particular laptop model comes from the manufacturer Clevo. Clevo is a company that distributes bare bone laptops for fully customized sales. There's a number of retailers that will sell this exact same laptop. HID Evolution sells it, ProStar Notebooks, and this particular unit comes from Eurocom. Now Eurocom did send this laptop over to me for review, but I will be returning it to them, and this is not a sponsored episode in any way. Eurocom is a high-end performance boutique manufacturer distributor that distribute not only Clevo laptops, but other laptops as well. It's a very good example of power trade-off when you fit in extremely powerful components in a system that isn't quite able to fully cool them, but by downclocking or undervolting, you're able to get an incredible performance, especially for the money. After all that lengthy introduction, let's get into this review. Here we go. First, let's talk about usability. This thing is a very thick laptop, but it weighs actually less than eight pounds. Though the power brick is also fairly weighty, right around three pounds as well. So total travel weight is about 11 pounds with everything, which isn't that unheard of, but it is quite a bit heavier than a lot of thinner gaming laptops that this will be going against. The trackpad is a solid trackpad. It works just fine. It has fully clickable buttons that are very tactile and they feel good. But I wish the surface was a little bit smoother and I wish the two finger scrolling was a little bit more responsive. A driver update would probably fix that, though I'm not sure I didn't try to switch the drivers on the touchpad. Now one unique thing about this touchpad is it does have a fingerprint sensor for quick unlocking your computer, which is pretty cool. The keyboard on this thing is actually really fantastic. It has deep travel. The keys feel very good. I've had a number of laptops with this deep travel style and I just love it. Now the keyboard is backlit with three zones and so it's not individually backlit, which is kind of a downside of this keyboard, but it is still possible to have a really cool looking keyboard if you set this up right. Now as far as ports go on the right side, we have a two-in-one mic headphone jack, a regular mic jack, an audio line in, and an audio line out. Then we have a regular USB 2.0, and then we have a USB type A 3.1. Then on the back, we have a full-size HDMI and two mini display ports. And then on the right side, we have our LAN port, a USB-C slash Thunderbolt 3 port, a second independent USB-C, which is basically unheard of. Hardly any laptops have two USB-Cs, only really high-end 17-inch laptops have that, and this is a 15-inch laptop with this many ports. Then you have two more USB 3.1 Type A's as well as a full-size SD card slot. So that is an insane amount of ports, way more than on basically any other 15-inch laptop, rivaling almost all 17-inch laptops. There's basically nothing missing from the port selection on this laptop. Now the display on this guy is a 144 hertz high refresh rate monitor with about a 95% NTSC color gamut, which is a solid color gamut. It's got a decent contrast ratio. It's basically on par with all other 144 hertz displays. Now when it comes to speakers, they're just average, which is kind of disappointing pointing considering how thick this laptop is. I would have thought they could fit in larger speakers and a little bit better bass, maybe a dedicated subwoofer. Now as far as battery life, this battery life is extremely minimal, but it is cool that you can quickly exchange your battery in just about five seconds. Obviously you have to shut down your computer first, then swap the battery, but it is very quick and easy. So if you need battery life on the go, it is possible to get several hours. As a general rule of thumb, you only get about an hour and a half of very optimized usability and only about 45 minutes of a reasonably heavy load. So you're gonna burn through those batteries really quick if you decided to carry some of them with you. Now the great thing about this laptop is it's very easy to take the bottom off and upgrade different things. You can swap the battery out very quickly. You can actually upgrade to up to 128 gigs of RAM, which is basically unheard of 
in laptops, there's very few that can go that high. You have a ton of heat sinks in this machine. You have three for the GPU and four on the CPU. Now you have a massive potential for storage here, multiple HDDs as well as M.2 NVMe drive slots. So you can really ramp up the total storage up to like 16 terabytes of storage if you really, really want to. Now a crucial aspect of this system is that both the CPU and GPU are socketable. The great thing about socketable CPUs and GPUs is that you're able to have backwards compatibility and future upgradability depending on what you're looking for. For example, six months ago, you would have bought this laptop with the 8700K and then now the 9900K is out, you can upgrade it. You could also put in some of the lower power watt processors as well, such as the 9700K, the 9600K. So it just depends on what level of performance you're looking for, but it's very customizable. And that also drastically affects the cost of the laptop, which is really cool because you could like get the base model now, then next year when you have more money, you could upgrade to a better processor. Now the new Nvidia graphics cards that will be coming out probably in January, maybe February, those will probably be upgradable, but we don't know for sure. The rumors are currently indicating that yes, they will be upgradable though. So, but there's no guarantee. So buy this kind of laptop at your own risk, knowing that it may or may not be upgradable in the future. All that said, if you were to go and order this right now, you'd, you could get this with the 8700K, which is probably the processor I would recommend for the vast majority of people. But those of you that are looking for a awesome processing machine, high-end rendering machine, get the 9900K or better yet, maybe get a big, bigger, beefier one that's able to cool this a little bit better. We'll get into that in a moment. All right, so let's talk actual benchmarks and performance. So taking a look at Cinebench first, this machine absolutely slays Cinebench more than any other 15 inch laptop that I have ever had uh, my hands on, even more than my 17 inch $3,000 Aorus X7. We're looking at 1897 out of the box, and this is a little bit lower than a typical desktop score of about 2050 or 2020, depending on your desktop. Now you'll notice that the scores drastically get throttled down very quickly, even by the end of the first test. Now these numbers right here are with stock clocks, and I was able to get quite a bit better numbers by down clocking, which I'll get into later when I talk about the temperatures. So how do these numbers stack up? Up compared to other laptops out there. Well, we've got the averages of these tests. We've got the Sky X4C coming in at 1776. And like I said, when I was tweaking it, I was getting about 1875 when I actually tweak the system properly. Comparing that to the Razer Blade 15, which is an ultra thin laptop, when it was undervolted by 100 millivolts, we got a score of 968. So that is almost half of the score of this laptop, which is an insane difference. And that does play out true when you look at render times as well, which we'll get into in a moment. The Asus ROG Strix, which has a slightly thicker chassis, better cooling, same processor as the Razer Blade 15, manages a 1219, and the Aorus X7 manages about a 1400 Cinebench score when overclocked to 4.3 gigahertz with a big hefty undervolt, and that is basically the optimum score. Its score out of the box is closer to 1350 when you have all stock settings. Taking a look at the overall gaming performance in Fortnite on Epic, we managed 142 frames per second. Even on the maximum possible settings, we're still getting high enough frames to hit our 144 hertz display consistently. In PUBG, we also managed to average 152, which is pretty insane. In Far Cry 5, we managed to average 101. And in The Witcher 3, we managed to average 86. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at how this performance compares to these other laptops. Taking a look at PUBG's FPS comparison, on the Eurocom Sky X4C, we looked at 152 FPS compared to the Razer Blade 15's 108, the Asus ROG Strix's 129, and the Aorus X7's 142. Taking a look at Far Cry 5, which utilizes the GPU and CPU quite heavily, we have much closer performance. The Eurocom only managed 101 FPS, the Razer Blade 15 got 83, the Asus ROG Strix 2 got 90, and the Aorus X7 managed 104. And of course, this is on absolutely all 
ultra settings. This is really good performance on all these laptops, but you are gonna get better performance actually on the Aorus X7 in this instance, simply because the GPU performance is slightly better than on the Eurocom laptop. Taking a look at the Witcher 3, we again have closer performance, but we do have quite a bit more performance with the Eurocom and the Aorus X7 hitting 86, 65, 71 and 85. The main thing to take away with these benchmarks is that depending entirely on your game, you're either gonna get dramatically great, fantastic FPS, or you're gonna get basically almost the same performance as a much thinner, lighter laptop. And in those situations, it definitely won't be worth it. Taking a look at Adobe render times, the Eurocom managed five minutes and 46 seconds, which is actually the fastest time we have seen, even faster than my water-cooled desktop with the 9900K, even overclocked to five gigahertz, which is kind of insane and unheard of and I'm not exactly certain what's going on there but I think it has to do with Intel integrated hardware acceleration going on with this laptop when the desktop does not have that. The Aorus X7 managed to get 8 minutes and 19 seconds and the Razer Blade 15 managed 10 minutes and 10 seconds. So as you can see, if you're looking to render video, this is the best laptop you can get. I'm going to put a big old caveat over that and that is if you know how to tweak your system and how to make it the best possible performance for each situation that you're in. And that brings me to the temperatures and the render times, depending on what frequency I set the processor at manually using Intel XTU. Now, all of these clocks were done at a 50 millivolt undervolt. When I underclocked the processor down to 3.6 gigahertz, which is the base clock, we managed to get six minutes and 48 seconds. When I upped that to 3.9 gigahertz, we managed six minutes and 20 seconds. At 4.2 gigahertz, we managed six minutes flat. At 4.4 gigahertz, we managed five minutes and 46 seconds. And when I ran it at stock, we also managed five minutes and 46 seconds. So as you can see, even if you run the processor at stock speeds, you're still gonna be significantly throttled and let me go ahead and explain why. Taking a look at the max wattage being used during the rendering of 4K footage, at 3.6 gigahertz, we managed 70 watts being used. At 3.9 gigahertz, we managed 87 watts being used. At 4.2 gigahertz, we managed 110 peak watts being used. 4.4 gigahertz, we managed 134 watts being used, and at 4.7, the peak was 154. So why is it that if we go back to these render times, the last two got identical render speeds? And it's simply this, no matter what clock speed you set it at, it's going to eventually throttle down after about 28 seconds at a higher speed to the 120 watt power limit. And because you're at that 120 watt power limit, no matter what, you're only gonna be hitting about 4.3 to 4.4 gigahertz. So what that means is that if you're pushing that envelope and you're hitting that 120 watts, you're gonna be hitting that 90 degree temperature as well. So this laptop is thermally designed to only maximally dissipate 120 watts worth of electricity throughput, which means that even if you set it at a higher clock speed, no matter what, you're only gonna be throttled down to 4.3 gigahertz at the best possible performance, at least when rendering. Now, this is not true when you're playing games. When you're playing games, you might actually be able to overclock it to five gigahertz in certain games, such as Fortnite. Though the performance gain is pretty negligible at that point, and you're just causing more heat in a laptop that's already struggling to maintain good temperatures. So does this laptop just brutally heat up and overheat like crazy? At stock settings, the answer is yes. Taking a look at our temps during our 4K render test, you can see at 4.7 gigahertz at the very bottom here, we hit a max temp of 98 degrees. But basically I've seen 99 degree temps consistently on this laptop when under full load. And that is because it simply cannot dissipate the heat quickly enough no matter what you do. Now the great news here is that if you're looking to do a lot of rendering, this thing has eight cores and 16 threads. So even if you do underclock it from stock settings, you're gonna still get dramatically better overall performance than any other 15 inch laptop on the market and really any other 17 inch laptop unless they have a desktop CPU as well. You can see that if we reduce the clock speed down to 3.6 gigahertz, we get a nice and cool 67 degrees and we're still getting an excellent render time, which is far better than the Aorus X7, despite the Aorus X7 actually being 
far hotter, hitting close to 85 degrees Celsius in a similar render test. Overall, I think the sweet spot for performance to temperature, at least when rendering, is right around 4.2 gigahertz, because then you're not pushing the thermal envelope. The maximum temperature is 85 degrees, and you're actually averaging close to 80 degrees when rendering at full 100% tilt. So if I was looking for a laptop under eight pounds to render videos, to edit videos, this is the best one money can buy, hands down, period, no questions asked. And I would set an AVX offset of minus five, which means that when I would render video, it would automatically down clock to 4.2 gigahertz for a nice, cool 85 degree render time and still having like 98% of the potential performance, just without any of the throttling or pushing the thermal envelope of the laptop. Now, depending on the game you're playing, I would consider underclocking the processor as well. And that's simply because the processor and CPU have a lot of heat pipes and two of them are shared across the vents. So that means that if you're gonna be rendering and pushing both the CPU and GPU, by ramping up the temperature of your CPU, you're gonna be increasing the temperature of your GPU as well, which could then cause your GPU to throttle, which we did see in some games. So in my mind, the ideal processor clock speed you'll want to shoot for is 4.2 gigahertz. Because for example, when we're playing Far Cry 5, at stock speeds at 4.7 gigahertz, we had the CPU hitting really high temps. We had a average temperature of about 95 degrees, which is higher than you would want in a laptop. But instead, what I would recommend is down clocking to 4.2 gigahertz. And then you're looking at average temps of 75 degrees and 80 85 degrees on the GPU, which is solid all around temps for operating games. And Far Cry 5 is one of the toughest games to play, which will push your hardware as hard as it can possibly be pushed. All of that to say, there are games on this system like Fortnite, for example, if you're hitting 144 frames per second consistently, you have very, very good temperatures in the high 60s, mid 70s. But if you're pushing as many frames as possible, like 300 frames per second, then you're gonna be hitting in the 85, 90 degree temperature range. So there are things you can do to optimize the temperature besides underclocking, and that is by limiting your overall frame rate down to 60 frames per second, down to 100 frames per second, down to 144 frames per second. So that way you're not overworking your CPU and GPU, thereby reducing your temperatures. And then also by underclocking the processor, you'll dramatically reduce the temperature of both the CPU and the GPU. So this laptop takes a lot of tweaking and I wouldn't really recommend it for the vast majority of people out there. This laptop is obviously gonna be very expensive as well, so it's really for the high-end enthusiast who's okay with tweaking the settings on their laptop to get the maximum possible performance, which is what this laptop will ideally deliver if you tweak it correctly. So at the end of the day, how much will this laptop cost you to buy? Configured it very similarly with the core components of a 9900K, a GTX 1080 graphics card, and a 144 hertz display. Those are are the three most important things this thing would run you about $2,600, which is actually pretty impressive considering my Aorus X7 cost $3,000 as a base price. That said, you could save a lot of money and just go with the base model 8700K processor and upgrade to maybe the 1070 for reduced heat or just put it to the 1080 and you can have a price anywhere from $1,600 to $2,100. And that is a very reasonable price ask for a level of performance that is basically better than any other 15 inch laptop out there. If I were to recommend a single configuration for gaming, I would say get the 8700K because you're gonna be able to actually overclock that processor to about 4.8 gigahertz pretty consistently in this chassis, especially if you undervolt it and overclock it. Now, the great thing about that is that it's not only cheaper, but you're actually gonna be not pushing the thermal envelope of the laptop, and you'll actually be able to overclock the processor for increased frames per second in a lot of games. Now, before I end this video, I wanna say that we did run into some issues with this laptop. First of all, the 9900K ran really good overall. It did have a few crashes, especially as I played with the settings, but that's to be expected as you're undervolting and overclocking the GPU, and especially pushing the thermal envelope that a laptop can handle. But when I swapped out the 9900K for the 9700K, I ran into issues with the 9700K of constantly crashing when rendering video and also when playing games. So. Uh, and it's really weird because the temperatures really weren't that high sometimes when it was crashing. The temps were only about 80 degrees. And I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but in the test that I was able to do with the 9700K versus the 9900K, I would highly recommend 
getting the 9900K because unfortunately the 9700K was running at the same wattages, the same power throughput, and the same temperature and clock speeds. So you were essentially just getting significantly less performance because the 9700K does not have hyperthreading. So those are my overall thoughts on this Eurocom Sky X4C. It's a great laptop for an enthusiast. For beginners out there, I recommend looking into another laptop. A laptop like this is just highly technical if you want to optimize it really well. For intermediate users, I would recommend taking a look at HID Evolution. They do pre-configure it and overclock and undervolt and all of that, and they only sell laptops that are running perfectly out of the box. And last but not least, this Eurocom Sky X4C would be a great option for expert users that already know how to overclock a processor or who want to learn, and you're not afraid to open up the bottom of your computer and maybe change out a few components. Components. Overall, pretty positive experience, and I will actually probably be buying one of these and replacing my Aorus X7 with it at some point down the line, perhaps when the new RTX cards hit the market. That's it for this episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Brandon, out.